Hare Krishna everyone, welcome back to the live studios here in Radha Lane, in Radha Lane. Very important day today, this is the appearance of Srimati Radharani, Sri Radha. So we're sitting in a building that's on a lane that has her name. <laughs> and it's the holiest of days because Srimati Radharani is the internal pleasure-giving potency of Krishna. Uh, the Chaitanya Charitamrita describes how Krishna, when he wants to enjoy, uh, it's not that each time he wants to enjoy, Radharani pops out of the air. <laughs> Radharani is eternal. She's always there. Uh, but she's the one who gives him pleasure. And therefore, she is the one who is showing everyone, all, all devotional service is coming through Srimati Radharani. You know, so if we want to please Krishna, we have to uh, please Srimati Radharani. And there's a, there's a, let me see, I compiled, I'm, I've been in the, pr in the process of compiling a file of all the different kind of things that I read about and I've heard some of my very deep god brothers give very wonderful classes on Srimad Duradharani and one of them is Shivaram Swami and I used to edit his books and he gave a lecture in Soho Street in London, downtown London on Srimad Duradharani it was so stunning I kind of took notes I just made an outline note I think and then over the years, over the last 26 years hey, I'm talking about Radharani <laughs> it's her day it's her day. Thanks very much. Yes. Carter. Nice name, Carter. <laughs> high class. Got high class parents. They have a big garden for you waiting in the <laughs> What? They have a seat in the garden. Waiting for me? <laughs> oh my God. So much, should I go over there? I don't know if it's now or before. <laughs> anyway. Um, and uh, yeah, and one of the things that I wrote down, let's see, I'll just read the first part of it because uh, yeah. Krishna Tabha Punya Habi Bhai E Punya Koribi Jabi Radharani Kusi Habi Dhruva Ati Toma Thai This is Bengali and it is one of the verses of a poem that Srila Prabhupada, or Srila Prabhupada wrote when he was on the boat ap approaching uh, the coast of America just off Boston Harbor and this verse translated says, I emphatically say to you, O brother, you will obtain your good fortune from the Supreme Lord Krishna only when Srimati Radharani becomes pleased with you. And uh, this is the first part of what I wrote. These were the first words penned by Sh Hey. Hare Krishna. Wow. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, how are you? What's your name? Sandy. Sandy, Eduardo Hare Krishna. It's very nice to see you again. Please sit, sit anywhere you want to sit. There, here's a oh, seat of honor over here. You can move this a little over towards the table and sit there. You, you like sitting on the floor better. You're a Vaishnava. Vaishnavi. She Vaishnavi. She likes to sit on the floor. Very good. Hare Krishna. Uh, today is a very pe special day. Did you just come from the temple? Yes, we came from the temple. Yeah, it's the appearance day of Srimati Radharani, who uh, is the internal energy of Krishna. One soul in two forms, the energetic source and the energy. And her, she's the internal energy, but particularly she's the internal energy that oversees and controls the pleasure-giving potency 
So Krishna enjoys through Srimati Radharani. And he doesn't actually enjoy through anyone else, although by her mercy we all enjoy uh, Krishna consciousness through her mercy and through her guidance. Hare Krishna, Hare Bo, how are you? A new face. I was just explaining to Lil, uh, uh, Lily and to Carter, uh, new faces, how every time I see a new face coming into this room to hear the Bhagavatam, I just light up because, <laughs> all, because it gives so, so much happiness to see uh, souls coming to hear the Srimad Bhagavatam, to hear about Krishna and become closer to Krishna and taste the, the nectar or the pleasure of being close to Krishna. So uh, I wrote something and I've been writing it for 26 years. I can't read it all at 60 pages about Srimati Radharani. But this is the first part. I'll repeat it to you because you just came in and I only got three lines in. Uh, Krishna tabi punya habi boy, e punya koribi yujabi, Radharani kushi habi. Dhruva ati toma tai. This is Srila Prabhupada, a prayer <coughs> that he wrote <coughs> called Prayer to the Lotus Feet of Krishna. And he wrote it on September 13th, 1965. And he was on the boat, the Jaladutta, and he was outside of, off the harbor before he actually set foot on the American soil for the first time. Uh, I emphatically say to you, O oh brother, you will obtain your good fortune from the Supreme Lord Krishna only when Srimati Radharani becomes pleased with you. These were the first words penned by Srila Prabhupada to the people of the West, written on, the, on, on board the ship Jaladutta, just before he disembarked to begin his monumental preaching mission. Who can estimate the potency and significance of these words? Srila Prabhupada, Abhaya Charan, would become a great devotee of Srimati Radharani. Uh, Srila Prabhupada explained to us that, that his father, who was a pure devotee of Krishna uh, and a great devotee of Srimati Radharani, uh, prayed to Lord Krishna that his son, Abhaya Charan, would become a great devotee of Srimati Radharani. <coughs> so how could the Lord refuse? Uh, by invoking the mercy of Srimati Radharani, Srila Prabhupada ensured the success of his mission because Krishna cannot refuse the request of Srimati Shri Radha. When Srila Gora Kishore Das Babaji initiated Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, the beloved spiritual master of our Srila Prabhupada, my spiritual master, uh, Das Babaji gave him the name Sri Varshabhanami Devi Daitaya. Das, the servant of Srimati Radharani, the daughter of Vrishabhanu. Srila Prabhupada was certainly passing on to the world the mercy given to him by these most influential personalities in his life. These relationships were hardly coincidences. Otherwise, how could those of us born and raised in the Western countries take up Krishna consciousness, having been addicted to, to sinful activities from the beginning of our lives by culture? The simple answer is that we receive the grace of Srimati Radharani through the grace of Srila Prabhupada. Out of feelings of extreme gratitude, it is our duty, therefore, on this most holy of days, Sri Radhastami, to glorify Srimati Radharani to the best of our limited capacity. With, without the blessings of Srimati Radharani, no one can please Krishna, because she is the internal pleasure-giving potency of the Supreme Lord. Our ability to understand Sri, Sri Radha Krishna comes from Srila Prabhupada, the pure representative of the previous acharyas or teachers. <clears throat> Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, in response to a devotee who pointed out one big businessman doing Dandavat Prikrama. Dandavat Prikrama means you go down on the ground and you put a stone where your, where your hands are stretched out and then you stand up and you put your feet where the stone was, and then you lay down on the, on the ground, and you put a stone where your hand is. And like that, you, you go around a holy place doing dandavat, prikrama. 
so there was this big businessman and he was doing this Dandavat Prikrama around Radha Kund, which is Radharani's bathing place and very, very dear to Krishna and uh, not different than her. So um, when, when Srila Bhakti, oh, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, in response to a devotee who pointed out one big businessman doing Dandavat Prikrama around Radha Kun said, yes, he worships Radharani because she is dear to Krishna. But we worship Krishna because he is very dear to Srimati Radharani. So we want to please Radharani, we worship Krishna because that makes her pleased. And Radharani's business is to bring others to come and be with Krishna. So um, the attempt to understand Sri Krishna or Srimadhi Radharani without going through Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is a breach of etiquette and is against our siddhanta or our the truth of our teachings, the ultimate truth of our teachings. Uh, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Radha Krishna Nahi Anya. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the combined form of Radha and Krishna together. Uh, Mahaprabhu is Krishna with the complexion and the mood of Srimati Radharani. And as Sri Srupa Damodar Goswami has said, Chaitanya Kyam Prakatam Aduna Tad Dvayam Chaikyam Aptam Radha and Krishna assume oneness in the form of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So, what did Mahaprabhu do? He came here and he distributed love for Krishna indiscriminately. In the Vedic culture, in order to hear and be able to chant the Hare Krishna Ma Mantra, which is nothing but names of Radha and Krishna, one has to become very qualified, purified by lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes of pious activity and becoming free from uh, acting against the laws of nature as we, we do just daily without even thinking about it in the, in the, West, in the Western world. So therefore, uh, if we want to please Srimati Radharani in the best way, then we will try to share what we are tasting when we hear about Krishna and when we learn about Krishna with others. That is the Sankirtan movement. Together, congregationally, we hear about Radha and Krishna and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Uh, and we try to, to distribute this bliss, this pure love uh, of God uh, the, high, the, the sweetest or the most intimate uh, variety of love for Krishna. So this is right off to me. And, uh, but because I made a vow to read Srimad Bhagavatam every day for the rest of my life, and it's a heavy vow, so uh, I have to do that. So we're going to now begin our reading of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Um, but before we do, we're going to read the glorification of Sanatan Goswami of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Sanatan Goswami, as I've repeated many times uh, in these sessions, <coughs> is the um, senior disciple of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu spent more time uh, teaching Sanatana Goswami than anyone else on the earth. So he's very deep and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu empowered him to write uh, literature, to explain the science of devotional service, pure devotional service to Krishna in the most uh, comprehensive way of anybody else. So here's what he said about the Srimad Bhagavatam. Sarva Shastrabdi Piyusha Sarva Vedai Kasatpala Sarva Siddhanta Ratnadya 
Sarva Lokai Kadrik Prada. O nectar from the ocean of all scriptures, singular fruit of all the Vedas, rich mine of the precious gems of all conclusive truths, you are the only giver of sight to all the worlds. Sarva Bhagavata Prana, Srimad Bhagavata Prabho, Kalidvan Dotita Ditya, Sri Krishna Parivartita. O life heir of all the Supreme Lord's devotees, O Master, Srimad Bhagavatam, you are the sun risen in the darkness of Kali. You are the exact image of Sri Krishna. Paramananda Pataya, Prema Varshakshadayate, Sarvadasava Sevyaya, Sri Krishnaya Namostume. I bow down to you, who were supreme, supremely blissful to read. Your every syllable pours down a flood of prema. You can always be served by everyone. You are Sri Krishna himself. So the Bhagavatam is a literary incarnation of Krishna. When Krishna left the planet 5,000 years ago and the Kali Yuga started, the shelter that he was giving to all the living beings in the universe went to the Srimad Bhagavatam. Made kabando matsangin Madguno man mahadana, man nistaraka mad bhagya, mad ananda namostute. My only friend, my constant companion, my spiritual master, my great wealth, my savior, my good fortune, my source of ecstasy, I bow down to you. The sadhu, sadhu ta dayin, atini chotatakara. O bestower of saintliness to the unsaintly, O exalter of the most fallen, please never leave me. Always appear in my heart and my voice with pure love. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Now we're on the second canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam and we've reached the sixth chapter uh, and beginning with the 19th verse. So the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam is more or less an introduction to the, to the book. There's uh, 12 cantos in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And uh, in the second canto, I mean, the first canto leads up to the historical events leading to the appearance of the speaker of the Srimad Bhagavatam at the moment when Maharaj Prikhet, this is Maharaj Prikhet here, this is c convenient, we have a little, what's it called, what do you call it? PowerPoint presentation here. This is, this is Maharaj Prikshit, and that's Shukadeva Goswami, standing. And these are all the exalted sages from all the universe, including Lord Shiva and Brahma and Narada, and all these great sages came from all over the universe just to be with, with Maharaj Prikshit before he left his body. So he found out that he was going to leave his body in seven days. And he decided, he was the king of the world, he was emperor of the earth. And uh, he had all of the opulences that you can imagine, uh, more than you can imagine. And he, he uh, agreed, or decided rather, to go to the bank of the Ganges, or the Yamuna, and fast until death. And he had all these sages giving him advice, what, and he was asking, what should I do, what's the best thing to do? And then they were all giving different answers because there are different philosophies and there are different teachers of different truths in the Vedas and sometimes they can be confusing. And then when Shukadeva Goswami shows up, he's naked and he's 16 years old and you know there's a, a bunch of kids and, and women following him around and teasing him because he acts like he's just dumb because he doesn't want to get entangled in the material world. So, but when all these great sages saw him, just by seeing him, 
because they were expert in the science of physiognomy. They saw, oh, this is the person who knows. And they all bowed down. And all the kids and women went, whoa, and then they ran away, you know. <laughs> and then, he, then they put Shukadev Goswami on the seat, and then Prakshit Maharaj began to inquire from him. So that's the second camp, beginning of the second camp, too, is the beginning of the teachings, the actual teachings. So um, one of the first questions that he asked was about the cosmic manifestation, how it was created. What is it? What is its purpose? What are we? What are all these energies? How do they all relate to one another? So we're on ch text 19 of this chapter, which is the cosmic manifestation. It's the Purusha Shukta confirmed. I think it's Purusha Shukta confirmed. Yes. Um, text 19. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is to be known as the Supreme Reservoir of all material opulences by the one-fourth of his energy in which the living entities exist. Deathlessness, fearlessness, and freedom from anxieties, the anxieties of old age and disease, exist in the Kingdom of God, which is beyond the three higher planetary systems and beyond the material coverings, purport. Out of, out of the total manifestations of the Sandini energy of the Lord, one-fourth is displayed in the material world, and three-fourths are displayed in the spiritual world. The Lord's energy is divided into three component parts, namely Sandini, Sambit, and Ladini. In other words, he is the full manifestation of existence, knowledge, and bliss. In the material world, such a sense of existence, knowledge, and pleasure is meagerly exhibited. And all living entities who are minute parts and parcels um, of the Lord are eligible to relish such consciousness of existence in the conditioned stage of material existence in the excuse me in the material world such a sense of existence knowledge and pleasure is meagerly exhibited and all living entities who are minute parts and parcels of the lord are eligible to relish such consciousness of existence knowledge and bliss very minutely in the liberated stage, whereas in the conditioned stage of material existence, they can hardly appreciate what is the factual, existential, cognizable, and pure happiness of life. The liberated souls exist in far greater numerical strength than those souls in the material world can factor Or arranged, did we lose the, uh, no? In the material world, the planetary systems are arranged in three spheres ca called Triloka, or Swarga, Marcha, and Patala. And all of them constitute only one-fourth of the total Sandini energy. Beyond that is the spiritual sky, where the Vaikuntha planets exist beyond the coverings of seven material strata. The upper three planetary systems are called sattvika planets because they provide facilities for a long duration of life and relative freedom from disease and old age, as well as a sense of fearlessness. The great sages and saints are promoted beyond the heavenly planets to Maharloka but that is also not the place of complete fearlessness because at the end of one kalpa, the Maharloka is annihilated and the inhabitants 
have to transport themselves to still higher planets. Yet even on these planets, no one is immune to death. There may be a comparative ex extension of life, expansion of knowledge and a sense of full bliss, but factual deathlessness, fearlessness, and freedom from old age, diseases, etc., are possible only beyond the material spheres of the coverings of the material sky. Such things are situated on the head, Adyai Murdasu. Text 20. The spiritual world, which consists of three fourths of the Lord's energy, is situated beyond this material world. And it is especially meant for those who will never to be who, are, who will never be reborn. Others who are attached to family life and who do not strictly follow celibacy vows, must live within the three material worlds. Purport. The climax of the system of Varnasham Dharma, or Sanatana Dharma, is clearly expressed here, in this particular verse of Srimad Bhagavatam. The highest benefit that can be awarded to a human being is to train him to be detached from sex life particularly because it is only due to sex indulgence that the conditioned life of material existence continues, birth after birth. Human civilization in which there is no control of sex life is a fourth-class civilization because in such an atmosphere there is no liberation of the soul encaged in the material body. Birth, death, old age, and disease are related to the material body and they have nothing to do with the spirit soul. But as long as the bodily attachment for sensual enjoyment is encouraged, the individual spirit soul is forced to continue the repetition of birth and death on account of the material body, which is compared to garments subjected to the law of deterioration. In order to award the highest benefit of human life, the Varnasham system trains the follower to adopt the vow of celibacy, beginning from the order of brahmachari. The brahmachari life is for students who are educated to follow strictly the vow of celibacy. Youngsters who have no taste for sex life can easily follow the vow of celibacy. And one fixed in the principle of such a life <clears throat> can very easily continue to the highest perfectional stage, attaining the kingdom of the three-fourths energy of the Lord. It is already explained that in the cosmos of the three-fourths energy of the Lord, there is neither death nor fear, and one is full of blissful life, of happiness and knowledge. A householder attached to family life can easily give up such a life of sex indulgence if he has been trained in the principles of the life of a brahmachari. His householder is recommended to quit home at the end of 50 years, Pancha Shordvam, Vanam Brajet, and live a life in the forest, not practical in this age. Then, being fully detached from family affection, he may accept the order of renunciation as a sannyasi fully engaged in his service. for ending the miserable life of material existence. And this process, in the highest degree, is recommended here in the Srimad Bhagavatam, with clear perception of ideal perfection, although basically there is no difference between the pro process of Buddhists, Shankarites, and Vaishnavites. For promotion to the highest status of perfection, namely freedom from birth and death, anxiety, and fearlessness. Not one of those, the pious householders or the fallen yogis or the fallen transcendentalists
for another is attained. Otherwise, it will prove to be a total failure. Lord Chaitanya was very strict in advising his followers in this matter of celibacy. One of his personal attendants chose because of his failure to observe the vow of celibacy. For he transiently indulged in sex life, especially in the renounced order of life. Sex life in the renounced order of life is the most perverted form of religious life and such a misguided person can, can only be saved if by chance he meets a pure devotee. So now we see in human society now what's happening as the priests in various religions are being exposed to have been abused, abusing or even men in some cases. And now the faith is destroyed. So this is the Kali Yuga. This is the age. These, all these things uh, confirm the conclusions of the Srimad Bhagavatam, which was written 5,000 years ago. Text 21. By his energies, the all pervading personality of Godhead is thus comprehensively the master in the activities of controlling and in devotional service. He is the ultimate master of both nations and factual knowledge of all situations. It's very interesting to, to note that Bhaktivinoda Thakur, who is credited with single-handedly purifying and reforming the disciplic succession of Lord Chaitanya, um, had ten children. And he was a magistrate. So this, these uh, laws, uh, celibacy or brahmachari, a householder is, who is actually following the, the laws of nature, and indulge in sex only to propagate Krishna conscious children to, pro to populate the earth with good population rather than dogs and cats. Uh, they can also attain to perfection. Not easy. Prabhupada compared it to trying to fast while living in a refrigerator. <laughs> but had a very nice sense of humor. Okay. We'll read this verse again. Text 21. <clears throat> By his energies, the all-pervading personality of Godhead is, is thus comprehensively the master in all activities of controlling and in devotional service. He is the ultimate master of both nations and factual knowledge of all situations. Purport. The word Vishwan is significant in this verse. One who travels perfectly in every field of activity is called the Purusha or Chetragya. These two terms, Chetragya and Purusha, are equally applicable to both the individual self and the Supreme Self, the Lord. In the Bhagavad Gita 13.3, the matter is explained as follows. Chetragyam chapi mam vidi sarva chetreshu barata chetra chetragya yor jnanam yat taj jnanam matamama. Chetra means the place, and one who knows the place is called the chetragya. The individual self knows about his limited field of activities, but the Supreme Self. The Lord knows about the unlimited field of activities. The individual soul knows about his own thinking, feeling, and willing activities. But the super soul, or the Paramatma, the supreme controller, being present everywhere, knows everyone's thinking, feeling, willing, and activities. And willing activities. And as such, the individual living entity is the minute master of his personal affairs, whereas the Supreme Personality of Godhead is the master of everyone's affairs, past, present, and future. 
บิดาห้ามสมถิทานี Only the ignorant person does not know this difference between the Lord and the living entities. The living entities, as distinguished from incognizant matter, may be qualitatively equal to the Lord in cognizance, but the living entity can never be equal to the Lord in full, in, in full knowledge of past, present, and future. And because the living entity is partially cognizant, he is therefore sometimes forgetful of his own identity. This forgetfulness. Is specifically manifested in the field of the ekapad bibuti of the Lord, or in the material world. But in the tripad bibuti of the Lord, well, it, but in the tripad bibuti field of action, or in the spiritual world, there is no forgetfulness by the living entities, who are free from all kinds of contaminations resulting from the forgetful state of existence. The material body is the symbol of the gross and subtle form of forgetfulness. Therefore, the whole atmosphere of the material world is called avidya, or nations, whereas the whole atmosphere in the spiritual of the spiritual world is called vidya, or full of knowledge. There are different stages of avidya, and they are called dharma, artha, and moksha. The idea of moksha. Or liberation, held by the monist in the matter of oneness of the living entity and the Lord, by ultimate merging in one, is also the last stage of materialism, or forgetfulness. Knowledge of the qualitative oneness of the self and super self is partial knowledge, and ignorance also, because there is no knowledge of quantitative difference, as explained above. The individual self can never be equal to the Lord in cognizance. Otherwise, he could not be placed in a state of forgetfulness. So, because there is a state of forgetfulness of the living individual selves or the living entities, there is always a gulf of difference between the Lord and the living entity, as between the part and the whole. The part is never equal to the whole. So the conception of 100% equality of the living being with the Lord is also n a t i o n In the field of n a t i o n s activities are directed toward lording it over the creation. In the material world, therefore, everyone is engaged in acquiring material opulence to lord it over the material world. Therefore, there is always clash. And frustration, which are the symptoms of nations. But in the field of knowledge, there is devotional service to the Lord, bhakti. Therefore, there is no chance of being contaminated by the influence of nations or forgetfulness, abhidya, in the liberated stage of devotional service or devotional activities, rather. The Lord is thus the proprietor of the fields, both of nations and of cognition, and it remains the choice of the living entity to exist in either of the above regions. Text 22. From that personality of Godhead, all the universal globes and the universal form, with all material elements, qualities, and senses, are generated. Yet he is aloof from such material manifestations, like the sun, which is separate from its rays and heat. Purport: The supreme truth has been ascertained in the previous verse as Purusha, or the Purushottama, the supreme person. The absolute person is the Ishwara, or the supreme controller, by his different energies. The ekapad bibuti, manifestation of the material energy of the Lord, is just like one of the many mistresses of the Lord, by whom the Lord is not so much attracted, as indicated in the language of the Gita, bina, 
Prakriti. Mina Prakriti means separated. It's the separated energy. Just like when we speak and we and our voice goes on to a, to a tape, or now we have digital things, to a device, and it's separate. The, the voice is separated from me or someone. And if, you po- and if you play it back, it sounds like you or me. And if the door is closed, you may make the mistake of thinking that I'm in the room. And in a sense, I am, because that sound could not have come into existence unless I vibrated it. But then it is separated from me. So the material, the whole material world and material existence and all the elements that form our bodies and the universal form and the uh, living environments of all the places in the universe and all the species of life, they're all separated energies. So the living being is not a separate energy, but it is separated by that material energy, by forgetful, through forgetfulness. But the region of the Tripadvibhuti, being a pure spiritual manifestation of the energy of the Lord, is, so to speak, more attractive to Him. The Lord, therefore, generates the material manifestations by impregnating the material energy, and then, within the manifestation, he expands himself as the gigantic form of the Vishwarupa. The Vishwarupa, as it was shown to Arjuna, is not the original form of the Lord. The original form of the Lord is the transcendental form of Purushottama, or Krishna himself. It is very nicely explained herein, that he expands himself, just like the sun. The sun expands itself by its terrible heat and rays, yet the sun is always aloof from such rays and heat. If impersonalists take into consideration the rays of the Lord without any information of the tangible, transcendental, eternal form of the Lord, known as Krishna. Therefore, Krishna, in his supreme personal form, with two hands and flute, is bewildering for the impersonalists who can accommodate only the gigantic Vishwarupa of the Lord. They should know that the rays of the sun are secondary to the sun. And similarly, the impersonal, gigantic form of the Lord is also secondary to the personal form as Purushottama. The Brahma Samhita confirms this statement as follows. Ananda chin mayarasa pratibhavitabhis tabir se eva nijarupa tayakala bihi goloka eva nifasat yakilatma bhuto govindam adipurusham tamaham bhajami The Supreme Personality of Godhead Govinda, the one who enlivens the senses of everyone by his personal bodily rays resides in his transcendental abode called Goloka, yet he is present in every nook and corner of his creation by expansion of happy spiritual rays, equal in power to his personal potency of bliss. He is therefore simultaneously personal and impersonal by his inconceivable potency, or he is the one without a second displaying complete unity in in a diversity of material and spiritual manifestations. He is separate from everything, and still nothing is different from him. That takes a little spiritual intelligence to, to understand what to speak of, figure out. Text 23. When I was born... This is Lord Brahma speaking. After being uh, inquired from by uh, questioned, after being questioned by Narada, his son, his mind-born son, Narada thought, "My father must be God because all these things are coming out of him, and the world being created, and he was there in the beginning, so he was watching." And he was saying, 
Then he asked his father, are you God? And Brahma is answering, answering that question. When I was born from the abominable, abominable, when I was born from the abdominal, <laughs> imperfect senses, what can I say? When I was born from the abdominal lotus flower of the Lord, Ma Vishnu, the great person, I had no ingredients for sacrificial performances except the bodily limbs of the great personality of Godhead. Purport. Lord Brahma, the creator of the cosmic manifestation, is known as Swayam Bhu, or one who was born without father and mother. The general process is that a living creature is born out of the sex combination of the male father and the female mother. But Brahma, the firstborn living being, is born out of the abdominal lotus flower of the Mahavishnu plenary expansion of Lord Krishna. The abdominal lotus flower is part of the Lord's bodily limbs, and Brahma is born out of the lotus flower. Therefore, Lord Brahma is also a part of the Lord's body. Brahma, after his appearance in the gigantic hollow of the universe, saw darkness and nothing else. He felt perplexity, and from his heart he was inspired by the Lord to undergo austerity thereby acquiring the ingredients for sacrificial performances. But there was nothing besides the two of them, namely the personality of Mahavishnu and Brahma himself, born of the bodily part of the Lord. For sacrificial performances, many ingredients were in need, especially animals. The animal sacrifice is never meant for killing the animal but for achieving the successful result of the sacrifice. The animal offered in the sacrificial fire is, to, so to speak, destroyed, but the next moment is given a new life by dint of the Vedic hymns chanted by the expert priest. When such an expert priest is not available, the animal sacrifice in the fire of the sacrificial altar is forbidden. So for that reason, no animal sacrifice is allowed in this age because there's no priest who can chant a mantra and bring the animal immediately back to life. Also, <clears throat> thus Brahma created even the sacrificial ing ingredients out of the bodily limbs of the Garbhutakshai Vishnu, which means that the cosmic order was created by Brahma himself. Also, nothing is created out of nothing, but everything is created from the person of the Lord. We're being taught now in schools, even up to university, that the universe came out of nothing. <laughs> it's the quantum leap or something, quantum jump. But we don't have any experience in our day-to-day -day existence of anything popping out of nothing. So how can we accept, accept these things? Ignorance. That's it. Anyway, also, nothing is created out of nothing. But everything is created from, a per from the person of the Lord. If God's a source of everything, and I'm a person, how can God not be a person? The dictation of the illusory energy tells us, some of us, but you're limiting God by, by saying he's a person. This is Maya, this is illusion. You're limiting God by saying he can't be a person. The Vedas say he's both impersonal and personal. So if you say he can't be a person, bye, we'll listen to someone else. The Lord says in the Bhagavad Gita, Ahang sarvasya prabhavo mattak sarva bhavartate Everything is made from my bodily limbs and I am therefore 
the original source of all creations. The impersonalists argue that there is no use in worshipping the Lord when everything is nothing but the Lord himself. The personalist, however, worships the Lord out of a great sense of gratitude, utilizing the ingredients born out of the bodily limbs of the Lord. The fruits and flowers are available from the body of the earth, and yet Mother Earth is worshipped by the sensible devotee with ingredients born from the earth. Similarly, Mother Ganges is worshipped by the water of the Ganges, called to such worship. Worship of the Lord is also performed by the ingredients born from the bodily limbs of the Lord. And the result of, and yet the worshipper, who is himself a part of the Lord, achieves the result of devotional service to the Lord. While the impersonalist wrongly concludes that he is the Lord himself, the personalist, out of great gratitude, worships the Lord in devotional service, knowing perfectly well that nothing is different from the Lord. The devotee therefore endeavors to apply everything in the service of the Lord, because he knows that everything is the property of the Lord and that no one can claim anything as one's own. Or if you do, it's only for a little while. <laughs> this perfect conception of oneness helps the worshipper in being engaged in his loving service. Whereas the impersonalist, being falsely puffed up, remains a non-devotee forever without being recognized by the Lord. Text 24. For performing sacrificial ceremonies, one requires sacrificial ingredients, such as flowers, leaves, and straw, along with a sacrificial altar and a suitable time, spring. Text 25. Other requirements are utensils, grains, clarified butter, honey, gold, earth, water, the Rig Veda. Yajur Veda and Sama Veda and four priests to perform the sacrifice. Purport. To perform a sacrifice successfully, at least four expert priests are needed. Kanzutai. Bless you. Hare Krishna. <laughs> to perform a sacrifice successfully, at least four expert priests are needed. One who can offer, Hota one who can chant Udgata, one who can kindle the sacrificial fire without the aid of separate fire, Advaryu, and one who can supervise Brahma. Such sacrifices were conducted from the birth of Brahma, the first living creature, and were carried on till the reign of Maharaj Yudhishthir. But such expert Brahmana priests are very rare in this age of corruption and quarrel, And therefore, in the present age, only the yajna of chanting the holy name of the Lord is recommended. The scriptures enjoin, Hare Nama, Hare Nama, Hare Nama, Eva Kevalam, Kalo Nasjeva, 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 Gatir Anyata. Text 26. Other necessities include invoking the different names of demigods by specific hymns and vows of recompense in accordance with that with the particular scripture for specific purposes and by specific processes purport the whole process of offering sacrifice is under the category of fruitive action and such acti activities are extremely scientific. They mainly depend on the process of vibrating sounds with a particular accent. It is a great science, and due to being out of proper use for more than 4,000 years, 
for want of qualified brahmanas, such performances of sacrifice are no longer effective, nor are they recommended in this fallen age. Any such sacrifice undertaken in this age is a matter, as a matter of show may simply be a cheating process by the clever priestly order. But such a show of sacrifices cannot be effective at any age. Fruitive action is being carried on by the help of material science and to a little extent by gross material help. But the materialists await a still more subtle advancement in the process of vibrating sounds by which the Vedic hymns are established. Gross material science cannot divert the real purpose of human life. They can only increase the artificial needs of life without any solution to the problems of life. Therefore, the way of materialistic life leads to the wrong type of human civilization. Since the ultimate aim of life is spiritual realization, the direct way of invoking the holy name of the Lord, as mentioned above, is precisely recommended by Lord Chaitanya, and people of the modern age can easily take advantage of this simple process, which is tenable for the condition of the complicated social structure. And we will end our reading for tonight. Hare Krishna. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. So this is our section that we inquire or uh, reflect anything that was heard that either isn't understood or makes a big impression or stimulates your spiritual intelligence to have a realization about please feel free yes sir I wasn't here for the reading but with the last part that was being spoke about I had someone present something to me today hmm. Um, regarding the proper process of achmania, that it should be swaha and not namaha the way we do it. This person's coming from the Matra branch, um, and he isn't his kind of devotee, he's an initiated devotee. Um, could you speak a little bit about that, about why we would see differences in, in place to place or something like that? It's a technical detail. And persons who are attached to the technical details are persons who may be compared to a person who is attached to the letter of the law and not the spirit of the law. So even though they may say the word swaha is, swaha is more appropriate than namaha, uh, when we observe their activities, the level of surrender that they can muster uh, may be less than somebody who's saying Namaha under the order of a pure devotee of Lord Chaitanya. And actually, Swaha and Namaha mean the same thing. There may some, be some technical difference. Swaha means giving oneself. Swaha, I give myself. Namaha means I offer obeisances to you. But sometimes the swaha can be interpreted by these priests who are spoken about in this section and the purports to want to give oneself means to merge. And the namaha means I'm here and I'm our is with you and we remain two, not one. So it's not really the meaning. The example is given in Chaitanya Charitamrita of the conversation that Lord Chaitanya had with Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. After Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, who was a hardcore Mayavadi impersonalist, not only hardcore, but he was teaching approximately 60,000 sannyasis, the Vedanta Sutra. That's how heavy a philosopher and authority he was. When he was enlightened by Lord Chaitanya and he took bhakti, you know, fully, and surrendered to Lord Chaitanya. There was one verse in the Bhagavatam that ends with uh, Mukti Pade. And he chanted it to Lord Chaitanya 
and he changed it to bhakti mate. And Lord Chaitanya chastised him. You can't change the Bhagavatam. He said, no, no, this mukti in my mind conjures up an impersonal concept, so therefore I can't say it anymore. And then Lord Chaitanya corrected him. He said, no, no, mukti means devotional service to Krishna in this context. And so he surrendered again. <laughs> so that's the idea. If people who argue over a word, whether it means this or it means that, and then, especially a person who has accepted the line of authority of a person who uses one word or another, which makes no difference actually, uh, is yet to uh, come to the stage of full surrender. Because he's finding fault with the authority. So perhaps he belongs in the uh, another sampradaya, which is nothing wrong with that. There are four sampradayas. We're not the only sampradaya. And if one wants to go back to Vaikuntha through another sampradaya, that's perfectly not only not only acceptable, but it's you know recommended for those who have that relationship, that type of mood, that type of love for an expansion of Krishna and if that's where they want to be and that's the way they want to worship with awe and reverence and not with spontaneous love of God in which you can become equal to Krishna or even superior to Krishna you can't really become superior to Krishna but Yoga Maya allows one to do that in Goloka Vrindavan and therefore taste a sweetness of love that is not available anywhere else. Does that answer the question? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Maharaj, yes, it's mentioned that uh, it's wrong that everything comes from nothing. And we can you know, practically see that there are several uh, conversations and examples given uh, where we now literally say, like, it's a stupid idea to have everything come from nothing. Yes. Uh, but as a father of uh, you know the growing child, and he goes to school and he is getting taught and will be taught the same uh, everything comes from nothing principle. So how should take him out of that school and put him in a school where they teach him the right thing? <laughs> Either that, or be strong enough as a father to correct it. When Prabhupada went to school, he surrendered, but when the teachers came up with an impersonal idea, he rejected. But externally, he was going along with it, but internally he rejected. And when it came time for him to get his degree, he didn't accept it. He did all the work, he did really good grades and all of that, and when it came time to get the diploma, he rejected it. And then he came out and he spread real knowledge all over the world. That could be a tough pill to swallow for a father nowadays. Especially when the kid's coming home and going, yes, but! And, and, and giving all kinds of, uh, you know, impersonal garbage in the name of uh, knowledge. And it takes intelligence, you know. I'll, I'll give you an example, a very clear example. Uh, when I first joined, not far, not long after I joined, uh, I found out there was a, there was an article published in some magazine. I don't remember a, a newspaper. It was in California, and they did a study uh, in a school where they analyzed the most uh, common disciplinary problems in the school. I don't remember whether it was a high school or a grammar, I don't remember what kind of school it was. And then they, they let 20 years go by and then they had the same you know, uh, study in the same school. In the first study, the most common problems were late attendance, being tardy, 
getting out of line when going from one place to another, you know, pulling the pigtails of the girls in front of you, <laughs> uh, chewing gum and putting them under the, you know. <laughs> you remember? Are you, are you old enough to remember? <laughs> I'm old enough to remember these things. It's, that's the way it was. I mean, I, I grew, I'm, you know, <coughs> you may not be able to believe this, but I'm 72 years old. And I grew up in the 50s in this country. And what we see now is mind boggling. You never heard, even in the news, you never heard of a mass shooting. Never. I think there was one in all the years when I was growing up, and it was in, here in Austin, Texas first one and before that there weren't any now they're a daily affair so anyway so then the next 20 years later they did a, a study in the same school and the main problems were uh, pregnancy out of wedlock uh, theft uh, assault of teachers, um, drugs, and I can't remember something else, rape, I don't know. And uh, so then, this is what Prabhupada means when he talks about illusion, how the material energy can convince a whole body of people of anything because they're thinking they're progressing. They have now cell phones and they can, you know, they're selfish. You know, and they can take a photo and then push a button and send it to their friends halfway around the world. And they think they've advanced. But if we look at the actual morality and, I mean, now the, 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 the President of the United States morality is being questioned by serious persons you know, not just politically, but serious questions are being raised about his competency and his, you know, his mental capacity, the way he's behaving. You know, when we were kids and we were studying the World War II and how a whole country would follow Hitler to do what he did, it's just inconceivable to us. But then now you see where in the United States of America they actually elected this guy. Of course, the system's a little strange, but anyway, I don't want to talk politics or <laughs> Bhagavatam class, but the idea is that, you know, progress in spiritual understanding and spiritual knowledge is not measured by uh, those things. Of course, it has a, a wonderful potential to do good. We're using, this is where broadcasting this, you know, daily reading of the Bhagavatam and discussion of the absolute truth through this medium. So we don't reject it, you know, we don't reject it, but we use it properly and try in that way to purify everything that has been made by the human energy. You know, I broke my elbow and went and got it fixed. Now I've got a little metal in here. I hope I don't go through any metal detector and get <laughs> accused of, <laughs> of keeping a wet weapon inside my elbow, you know. Or a robot. A robot, yeah. <laughs> Farther things out of are happening nowadays. <laughs> more and more people have metal in their body. They're oh. getting used to it at the airport. Yeah. <laughs> they know what to look for. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, anything else? Anyway, thank you all for joining us in this sacrifice. This is a sacrifice. To hear the Bhagavatam every single day is the supreme sacrifice of intelligence and of the human form of life. Uh, so thank you so much for coming. And Please come regularly, and uh, thank you out in cyberspace. I don't know if there were any questions today. Were there questions? No. Um, no, last time I had a reflection.
What is her reflection? Read it. Symbol of the of the growth of, of the a symbol of the gross and subtle form of ignorance. Yes, I think we can all attest to that fact. Anybody that's in a human body. Okay, thank you, Rati Hari Krishna, Shrimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Shrimati Radharani ki jai, Shri Radhasthami ki jai, Gaur Premanandi Hari Hari Bo.